Hi guys, welcome back and uh, here we are again with Cat with Mr. Hambury and in today's video again we're looking at concepts, okay, terminology and the ones we're looking at today um, are these. So we're looking at software, we're looking at convergence, um, an age-old one, RAM and ROM, uh, biometrics and then right at the bottom we're looking at green computing. So without further ado, let's jump in. Okay, so let's jump into our first concept and uh, the first one we are looking at is software. Okay, so when they ask you what is software, this is this is going to be, it's going to be a little more complex. It starts off simple, uh, but then as we go down, there's a lot of information that comes through with it. So first things first, when you think of software, have a look at that, saying the programs which perform specific tasks. Now you can see I've highlighted that there. So um, these are programs that perform specific tasks. This is what we're talking about when we mention the term or use the term software. Now with that, there are, and you can see, um, I've just made a note of this, there are two types, right? Two types of software. Um, I will have some more imagery maybe around here, but there's system software and there's application software. So when you think of system software, it is a program that manages the entire computer system. For example, Windows. Okay, so that can be any version of Windows. So if they ask you, um, what is software? You're going to say it's a program that performs a specific task. Uh, if they ask you for or ask you what system software is, again, you'll say it's a program that then in its task, what does it do? It manages the entire computer system. And an example would be Windows. Now, um, for exam purposes, you don't want to just put Windows. Um, you might not get the mark. You need to put a version as well. So whether you say Windows 7, Windows 8, doesn't matter what it is, but at least put a version down. The other form of software is, and let me just move over to this side, um, application software. In fact, this is where the term apps come from. So when you think of your phone, you have different apps. Those apps are applications. They are programs that perform a specific task, but they don't manage the entire system. And this is why they are just applications, All right? So for example, Microsoft Word, that is an example um, of a piece of software that performs a task. Now, just an added note, system software. Think of, think of your phone, think of your computer. Your computer can run with Windows and nothing else, okay? Your computer does not need Microsoft Word to switch on. It doesn't need, your phone doesn't need WhatsApp to operate. Although for some of you, <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna go into that. But um, when you get your phone, generally you don't have many apps on them and the phone still operates. You can still phone, you can SMS, you can do these things. When you get your laptop, if you don't have Microsoft Office, if you don't have um, any sort of additional package like that, it still operates. Why? Because the system software runs everything. The application software, those are the additional programs that we add to give us extra features. Things like video editing, um, VLC Media Player for watching videos, you know, all these type of things. So just know, number one, what software is. Number two, the two um, types of software that you get, be able to explain them and give examples. Right, the next term we're looking at is convergence. And there I've got a little, excuse my art, <laughs> um, little picture of a cell phone. So what is convergence? Now, when we think of converging, um, the term converge, we're talking about coming together, okay? If I say all of us as learners, we are going to converge on the hockey field, means we are all gonna go there together to that one place. So when we talk about convergence as a term, convergence is the bringing together or bringing different technologies together into one device. Now, think about this. Uh, maybe you can ask your folks or your grandparents when they had cell phones, the, the original cell phones. And I'm talking now about things like the Nokia 5110, the Nokia 3210, uh, the Motorola, Razer, those phones. 
they could only do a few things, and that was to phone, SMS, and in some cases, we could even play Snake. I'm not giving my age away by that. No. <laughs> okay. But that's what you could do. Today, think of what you can do on a cell phone. You can phone. You can SMS, which some of you do. You can WhatsApp. Okay. You can video call. You can take a video. You can take pictures. You can record audio. Um, I've even seen some news reporters when they are recording uh, audio from you know various sources, they simply use their phones. So they've taken all those different technologies and brought them together. Again, think back maybe 20, 30 years ago. I would have a cell phone. I would have a laptop. I would have a video camera. I would have a digital camera. All those devices I'd be carrying and having bags on me. What do I need? Today, like I'm doing with this recording, all I need is my cell phone because all these technologies have come together into a single device. Okay, another um, set of terms that actually confuses many is the difference between RAM and ROM. Okay, so when we look at RAM, this is the first thing you need to understand. First thing we need to just clarify. Um, it stands for Random Access Memory. So when they ask you what is RAM, many times telling them that it stands for Random Access Memory doesn't mean anything. Okay, so just read the question and see what they're actually asking you for um, and the mark allocation as I've mentioned in previous videos. Uh, but if they ask you what does it stand for, it's Random Access Memory. Now, what does RAM do? There's our notes. Number one, okay, first of all, in fact, let me use this one. It's a primary storage area. So when we, and in a previous video, I looked at the specs of a PC. When they ask you, um, what's the primary storage area or the primary memory um, in the computer? We are talking about the RAM. So what RAM does is it, it holds instructions right, for different applications. So when you um, open an application in Windows, what's going to happen is that instruction gets written into RAM and then the program opens. So you can imagine through the course of the day, there's all these different instructions going into RAM. And if you don't have enough RAM, if it's not big enough, if it's not fast enough, it ends up slowing your PC down. And this is why generally when you switch a PC on and off, um, the sort of problems you have usually go away. And this is because of one important factor, that RAM is what we call volatile. In other words, it changes. So all those instructions that have been stored in RAM while you've been working on your PC, when your PC is switched off, everything is wiped clean. Okay, it's like it's starting from scratch and this is why uh, many IT people when, when you have problems with your computer the first thing they ask you is have you switched it on and off have you tried restarting the PC because usually um, there could be something stored in RAM that's causing a problem uh, but that's what RAM does okay so it's important to know what it stands for and that it's volatile it's the primary storage area um, and it holds instructions now ROM on the other hand uh, stands for our read only memory it is non-volatile and this means what? It means it cannot be changed. So the permanent instructions, that's why I've put here, holds permanent instructions that ROM has. So in other words, when the PC is built, um, these instructions get put in and when the PC starts up, these instructions get acted on. So ROM is non-volatile. You cannot change it. All right. Um, and this is the important difference between the two. Instructions have already been programmed into the ROM to do specific things. So I hope that clears up the difference between those two. The next one is very, very interesting. And you've seen this on so many movies. We're dealing with a term called biometrics. Okay. So first of all, what is biometrics? Let's check it out. It's the use of a body part um, as a security measure. Okay, it's just, it is as simple as that. So why do I say we've seen it in the movies? You've seen spy movies, you've, you, you've seen these superhero movies, and what happens? The guy comes up to a vault or some sort of secure place, and he takes his hand and he pops it onto the screen, and it scans it, or he takes you know his glasses off and he checks the eye out there, and they scan the iris, or they scan his face, and everything is fine, it checks through everything, and it allows him in. In other words, instead of having a key, or, or some sort of combination, we're using a body part, right? Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to this. 
And one thing you need to understand is that the movies don't always tell you the truth. For example, um, in the movies, you would have seen that if I'm using my hand as a security measure, or let's say my uh, thumb, scan the thumb. Right. Now somebody breaks in and they in, I, I don't want to give them my code. I don't want to you know, scan my thumb. So what do they do in the movies? They just cut off your hand or they cut off your thumb and they take your thumb, put it in a packet. And when they get to the, the door, zip, scan it and everything's okay. And that's not reality. Okay. Why? Because when that device scans, it also scans for blood flow in that particular um, item. So whether it's the finger or the hand. And obviously, if you've got a cut off, <laughs> it's not going to work. Another disadvantage is, uh, let's say, for example, you scan in your face, right? And you went out and you had a fight with someone. No, but you had a fight with someone. Got beaten up and your face is a bit swollen. You come home and you need to scan your face. What do you think is going to happen? There's going to be some problems, okay? So those are some of the disadvantages. Obviously, some of the advantages is the fact that it's more secure. It's only tuned to your particular um, body parts. And, and nobody can crack that or nobody can get through that unless they have access to you as the security measure. Our last concept for this video is green computing, okay? So when you think green computing, immediately when we think green, we think about things which are environmentally friendly, uh, things which are good for the environment. So it's no surprise that the term is then um, using computers in a way that is what? Environmentally friendly. Okay, so let's think of this. If we want to use computers in a way that's environmentally friendly, what are we going to do? Usually when we have printers, for example, um, and we need to get new cartridges because everything's empty. What do we do? We have one options. Number one, we can take the cartridges and throw them away. Or in an environmentally friendly way or in a green computing manner, what we would do is take those cartridges and have them refilled. Okay. If we want to throw away our old computers, what would we do? We would take it to a recycling plant where they can actually recycle all those different materials. Um, when it comes to printing, we would make sure that we use both sides of the paper that we're printing on. Okay, so all these are measures that we put in place or that we use in order to use our computers in an environmentally friendly way. I mean, even things like uh, switching the screen off when you're not using it, switching the computer off when you're not using it. Those are all ways in which we practice green computing, using our computers in an environmentally friendly way. Folks, I hope um, you have clarity on all these terms and uh, I'll see you in the next video.